for the Pacifica Radio Network. Welcome to a special edition of Planet Waves FM. This is for Tuesday, the 26th of July, 2016. This is a supplemental edition to the regular program that is, uh, that's also available right now. And I have decided to separate off this bit because it contains an interview with a guy by the name of Robert Schmidt from down in Maryland. Robert Schmidt is a research astrologer. And he's also the co-founder of Project Hindsight and currently the leader of that project, which began in 1993 in an effort to retrieve uh, astrological texts, ancient astrological texts, and translate them accurately so that astrologers had some sense of their own heritage. Not merely some sense, but actual uh, accurate documentation of what came before us up to that time. Uh, First of all, there was not all that much interest in it, and it was very difficult to find. The history of astrology was a kind of a hazy thing that most people didn't really have a clue about, including some pretty erudite and uh, talented astrologers. And so Project Hindsight addressed that void of information. Astrology has never been particularly well respected by the Academy, by the way, and so while there were many other translations of, of texts from that era, the astrological texts uh, were, were not generally translated or translated accurately, and so astrologers had to take this on and uh, and do it themselves. There were three principal partners of Project Hindsight at the outset, Robert Zoller, Robert Hand, and Robert Schmidt, who I refer to as Bob, and one of the things that uh, that distinguishes Bob Bob's work is that he stuck with Greek astrology, uh, while Zoller and Hand uh, studied and translated and worked through and have lectured on many different types of astrology, particularly medieval astrology. It was Bob Schmidt who stuck with Hellenistic astrology, which he calls Greek astrology, and ha- has developed that. And one of the things that th- they figured out pretty early on and that I knew about back in the in the mid 2000s when I had my first conversation specifically about this subject with Bob Schmidt and his wife Ellen Black Coffee is that there was a founding era of astrology there are references in the literature to founders of astrology and one of those founders went by the Name it was not known initially whether it was a pen name or a real name, Hermes Trismegistus. I hope I'm saying that right. I don't hear it very often. Okay, so so there there, there was this idea that, that, that they began to uh, work with as referenced in the literature that there, there were founders of this, that astrology did not come on a ship from Atlantis or it, it, it was not uh, cr- cracked open out of an Egyptian pyramid but the astrology that we know, which I want to be careful to distinguish is Greek astrology as separate from what the Egyptians were doing, as separate from what the Babylonians were doing, as separate from uh, what the Mayans and the Aztecs were doing in different parts of the world. Obviously, astrology is a, is a kind of a, th- a thing that finds its way into every society, and then there's quite a bit of cross-pollination. But what Bob has discovered, and with significant help from Ellen, who handled a, a major portion of uh, this particular investigation is that the astrology that we do, Greek astrology, which is the foundation of Western astrology, which includes ideas like Venus rules Taurus and the moon rules Cancer uh, and and Saturn is exalted in Libra, the, the, the things we take for granted <clears throat> as being astrologically true come from Greek astrology in the approximately the 4th century B.C. And not only that, but that the, their, their origins are, are not actually, when you read the literature, as Bob has done for many years, 23 years or so, it points to people, and, and in particular points to someone who they have deduced is Eudoxus of Knidos. A mathematician and astronomer extremely famous in his day, one of the great mathemat- mathematicians in, from, you know, from the classical G- Greek era and considered one of the great mathematicians of all time. And so already a kind of an inventor codified the system, is what they're saying, the system that we use for classical 
astrology, which includes the earliest astrological document known called the Thema Mundi. I will attach that. It's not, it doesn't look very interesting on the outside, but when you start to go through the layers and, and pry into it and, uh, and, and look at what it infers, and when you add a few other layers, which we, we get into in our conversation, uh, it's quite a, a beautiful thing. It's the approximate equivalent of what the circle of fifths is to music theory. At the end of the discussion, I asked Bob about the relationship between music and astrology in the founding era, because that circle of fifths and that theme of Monday look really quite similar. And, and the astrological method and the method of doing music theory, which comes out of Greece, are so strikingly similar that uh, I thought there, there might be a connection. It turns out that Eudoxus's teacher, one of his teachers, Greek teachers, was one of the inventors of what today we think of as music theory. So they, they are, um, in, in a sense, astrology is partly a derivative of music theory. We, we cover that in the last 15 minutes of the conversation. I had always suspected that there was a connection. These two diagrams are are so similar, and th there are so many astrologers who are also musicians. It is no accident that uh, that so many of us are obsessed by music, and it's nice to do music because it, it, it gives, we astrologers spend a lot of time in our minds, a lot of times theorizing and writing and explaining things in very rational Greek terms, which is a very left brain activity, and music provides the freedom and the space to play with a more intuitive right brain type of activity, where the reasoning process does not have to be so nailed down, where mathematics doesn't make so much sense, but imagery and poetry do make more sense. And so there, in, in a sense, astrology uh, has its counterpart in music. So we get we get to that at the end. But what I basically do in this conversation is I take you know I I'm your representative with Bob Schmidt, right? So uh, I start the conversation with the theme of Monday, with this uh, teaching chart, which is the chart that places Cancer in the ascendant. And so one of the radical things about the discovery of the theme of Monday and the understanding of what this thing is uh, reveals that the association that we have between Aries and the first house is not entirely accurate. Aries is the first sign. Of course, it's going to have some resonance with the first house. But in the first chart, in the chart that is the teaching tool and that is, in a sense, the decryption key to all of astrology, this very simple, deceivingly simple, like many th things from science and esoteric teaching, has Cancer in the Ascendant, therefore Scorpio on the 5th, Aries on the 10th. And I was aware of this as early as 2006 and began applying it to my work with great success. We also talk about whole sign houses, equal houses, um, the, the use of house systems such as equal or, in my case, Coke, superimposed over whole sign houses, what the real definition of of a house cusp is, which I also learned from reading the book Whole Sign Houses by Robert Hand. Uh, th this is confirmed in, in, from, from a similar thread of research. And uh, this is mainly presented for your information and uh, kind of in intellectual adventure. Now, I'm aware that there are, are uh, people who don't like this theory and they say that it can't possibly uh, be true and that nothing uh, traces back to one person. Uh, I want to be clear, it's my understanding there's not that Eudoxus did not do this alone. He had collaborators, but was something like the principal author of a highly integrated system that works pretty darn well for a 2,400-year-old device, kind of like mathematics works well to this day. So anyway, without uh, you know meandering around here too much, l let's let the conversation that Bob and I had yesterday do the work. 
I do welcome your comments. Uh, depending on where you're listening to this, uh, it is possible to register uh, for either one of the Planet Waves blogs, either uh, Planet Waves members.planetwaves.net. It's a free registration if you'd like to take part in the conversation there, or you're welcome to uh, advance the conversation on my personal Facebook page. So we can keep that uh, in one place on Facebook, though, of course, we post to all of them. I consider this to be big news in the world of astrology and uh, and truly exciting. I do concede that I have had 10 years to get used to the concept of the theme of Monday, of the, of the founders and the principal founder, Hermes, who that's not his name he uses. They seem to all use uh, pen names to do this work. There's another guy named Asclepius, and there's one other one. I believe there are two other people considered founders. Uh, I've had time to get used to these ideas. Ten years is a while to think about something. And I've had ten years to work with the theme of Monday. Uh, you are probably hearing about this for the first time today, and uh, I recognize you haven't had that much time. In any event, I, I present this for your interest. I'm truly curious your feedback. You are welcome to email me at efc at ericfrancis.com. I will gladly pass along any comments you have to Bob Schmidt and Ellen Black. And without further delay, here is my conversation from the morning of July 25th, 2016. Uh, I was in Kingston and uh, Bob was down in Cumberland, Maryland. Here you go. I'd like to welcome to Planet Waves FM, Robert Schmidt, someone that I've been listening to for about 20 years. I believe I met you first in the summer of 1996, Bob. And uh, I think and, that's right. It was at the Ithaca Conclave, right? Yeah, phase three, yeah. Uh, where your uh, beautiful partner, Ellen Black Coffee, was running around with <laughs> coffee pots. So my friend and I <laughs> named her Ellen Black Coffee because she was always okay. seen traversing the front of the room with a with a pot of coffee. So that was everybody got everybody got their, their got a new name at that conference, at least in our right. my little section of the audience. Um, and so, w by way of saying that I'm accustomed to these ideas in a way that people who are just being introduced to Project Hindsight material might not be. And then, in addition. Um, the the kind of cult of classical astrology has taken off among young astrologers, but they are jumping in in the middle of the story. And I think that, as you're indicating in some of your work, there's some context issues with that. And um, so, you know, I'm going to be the moderator between you and the audience, and I, I know enough to ask the occasional intelligent question. And thank you for really enriching my astrology studies and, and my practice, first of all. Well, you're welcome. That's what I'm trying to do, I think. <laughs> the Theme of Monday, you know, you, you, um, you, we did our first piece on the Theme of Monday 10 years ago, and I put that to work immediately. And so it's never out of my mind when I'm reading a wheel. Um, I'm always looking for the signs in, in relationship to the Cancer Ascendant of that sign. And um, always keep my eye on 15 degrees and so forth. But anyway, let's start at the beginning. Uh, I got an email on Thursday night, right around the time of the full moon, uh, that said, Eudoxus did it. <laughs> I'm like, wow, <laughs> they've, they've gone public with their discovery. Yeah, and they've also gone nonlinear and maybe a little crazy. <laughs> yes, and, and you know, how many people understood that email when they saw it? Like, how many had that flash of recognition? I don't know. But I was sitting in a cafe in New Paltz, New York, and I thought, wow, this is big news. And uh, the first thing I did was I called up David Arner, one of my teachers, and the person who introduced me to Project Hindsight, and said, hey, I just got an email from Schmidt that uh, said who the probable inventor of astrology was. Greek astrology. Greek astrology, yes. Mm -hmm. Greek astrology, which you're saying is the astrology that we do, pretty much. Yes. Right? Yeah, it, go ahead, go ahead. It, yeah, the Greek, Greek astrology is the beginning of what we would call Western astrology. I mean, we use largely the same, modern astrology uses largely the same collection of um, uh, what people call techniques, um, uh, except it's quite reduced from what it was originally. Lots and lots of um, techniques and concepts that belong to the original Greek system 
um, are no longer in evidence in modern astrology. But I don't think it's uh, uh, an, a stretch to say that Western astrology uh, begins during uh, the Greek period. And we're talking about about the 4th century B.C. If we're talking about Eudoxus, we're talking about the classical period. Um, now, the novelty of our claim um, is that the astrology began during the, the 4th century uh, with Eudoxus, whereas it has hitherto been thought that it began in the Hellenistic era, probably in the 2nd or 1st century uh, B.C. And the um, and this has sort of been established, accepted doctrine by virtually all scholars. And what we're saying is that it actually began about 200 years earlier than that, uh, and that Eudoxus of Canidos was the originator or progenitor of the astrology that later um, sort of appears or comes on the scene uh, during the Hellenistic period. Mm -hmm. So that implies that there was a period of time during which uh, it was being developed pretty much, you might say, in secret. At least there's no evidence of that earlier activity. Um, and so that's, that's the claim. Right. Um, I, I used to call this the mystery school theory, which is that based on what I learned from you, I figured, all right, there there may have been this phase where the practice of astrology was underground and it comes to the surface all at once um, in, in, in the first or second century BC, as you're suggesting, right? Yes, that's but you're right. Saying it was practiced before then. And where I picked up the story with you about 10 years ago, you, you seem to be on to the fact of the founders yes. and the founding era. Yes. Um, and and uh, that there was one founder who used the pen name, the kind of secret, whatever name, you know, kind of professional name, Hermes Trismegistrus. Yes. And um, it probably wasn't Hermes Trismegistrus, the actual guy, but it was someone working under that name. Um, and then you went on to figure out who who that was. I am saying that we would identify um, this legendary Hermes <clears throat> with Eudoxus of Canidos. Right. Yes. Yeah. Now, because I've been pondering this for 10 years, it, it makes sense to me. To someone who is more schooled in like either New Age theories that the Atlanteans brought it all over, you know, Barbara Han Cloud tells us the well, yeah, the Atlanteans and and uh, Alice Bailey says it's the Atlanteans and so forth. A lot of people get the credit, uh, but Eudoxus was a mathematician and astronomer. Yes, a seemingly smart guy. He uh, was incredibly famous in his day. Um, I mean, he was a mathematician and an astronomer. Uh, he wrote a book on geography. Uh, he traveled all over the Mediterranean area. Um, he was familiar uh, or was associated with the Platonic Academy, uh, so certainly knew Plato, um, Aristotle, all that gang. So he's um, in, the, that's amazing that he was in that, alive in that era, in those circles. Yes. He knew Plato he would have and been, Aristotle. He would have been, uh, according to recent scholarship, um, he was born around 390 yep. B.C. And that would make him about 38 years younger than Plato and seven okay. or eight years older than Aristotle. I'm sorry, I missed how many years younger than Plato? He would have been about 38 years younger than Plato right. and about seven or eight years older than Aristotle. And he spent time at the Platonic Academy on at least one occasion, probably more than one, um, according to an account by Proclus um, about the mathematical uh, work that was going on at the Platonic Academy. Um, Eudoxus was one of a number of people who were developing geometry um, in Athens under the 
sort of general direction of Plato. So he was not um, he was not a, 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 a an obscure figure by any means. Yeah. Um, he was very very distinguished, very famous in his day, probably in his day more famous than Aristotle. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're not talking about some minor figure here. We're talking about somebody who was right in the middle of the classical period, uh, knew all the the people uh, who were the significant people of the time, and was right in the middle of all of the intellectual activity that was going on at that period. Mm-hmm. So um, he he's... I mean, if our claim is right, it means that the astrology was actually introduced by some a man of that caliber. Yes. And to them, what was astrology? To you, what did Eudoxus, as far as you can tell, what, what did he think he was doing? I think that the way to put it, <clears throat> and this might help make people understand a little bit what, uh, why someone like Eudoxus could be considered to be the founder, um, what everyone was doing in that period, this is Plato, Aristotle, and all their, their contemporaries, is they were interested in cosmology. And uh, cosmology for the Greeks, and um, particularly anyone that was a member of the Pythagorean school, and Diogenes Laertius, who writes a little short biographical sketch of Eudoxus, considers him to be the last of the original Pythagoreans. For the Pythagoreans, um, cosmology was, um, the, the study of cosmology was to understand the cosmos as a well-ordered, well-arranged whole. That's sort of their little formula. Now, um, <clears throat> Eudoxus almost certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, almost certainly had his own, just one second here, (laughs) almost certainly uh, had his own um, cosmological speculations. And so someone who was uh, interested in understanding the cosmos in such a manner uh, could, in fact, uh, be interested in ways in which the planet realm was associated with the realm of the signs, and so forth, and I'm saying that the the astrological concepts as we now know them um, originally have a cosmological import initially. Um, now, one of the persons who had a huge impact on uh, Greek cosmology was a man named Anaxagoras. Uh, he was about the age of, of um, Socrates. And Anaxagoras had a view, or introduced the idea, that the cosmos was ordered by a divine intelligence. Uh, in Greek, this would be nous. So there was well, you, a divine... Nous, the in, word nous, nous, N-O-O-S, as in nous no, here. No, N-O-U-S. Okay, the, the, this is the Greek word for mind, um, we get the word noetic, for instance, from uh, from noose. It, it's a general word for for mind. What about Teilhard uh, de Chardin's idea of the new sphere? Of the new I, I didn't hear that. The, the the sphere of all intelligence and all data. It may, it may be related. I, I I don't know. Yep. Okay. I, so um, so he they have this concept of the noose. This yes. is a- Axagoras. Anaxagoras. Anaxagoras. Yes, and. The, the famous statement by Anaxagoras is that um, the, the noose, or the divine intelligence, um, orders what has been, what is, and what will be. So everything is orderly in the cosmos. So someone might say, well, gee, if I could only second-guess the cosmic mind... Um, I would know what has been, what is, and what will be. So through uh, um, that type of cosmological speculation, you could see that something like astrology as a prognostic could also have developed out of such cosmological thinking. So what I would say is that Eudoxus developed 
a cosmology with uh, predictive or prognostic potential, <laughs> let me just put it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on one level they were interested in working with a linear model of time and wanted to know what was happening. Yeah, yeah, surely. I mean, we all do, don't we? I mean, you know, um, but this would provide some kind of rational approach to actually um, uh, having a prognostic or an astrology in the, in the modern sense of the word. It would give some justification or motivation for even trying to develop such a thing um, rather than just have, okay, well, there are some magic practice here. We're going to look at the sky and and whatnot. Uh, one thing I should say is that um, to assert that astrology began uh, as a cosmology is very different than what evidently was happening in Babylonia uh, before Eudoxus's day and also concurrent with his own lifetime, right. where you have um, the priesthood making observations over a long period of time uh, and then writing down what happened when the planets were in different positions. So they had their own empirical correlations that had been assembled over, you know, over millennia, actually. Now, what I'm talking about is an astrology that has a different motivation, it's not based on that type of empiricism, simply correlating celestial events with um, he human events over a long period of time. What I'm talking about is an astrology that comes out of a cosmology which is highly rational. In other words, there, there are assumptions being made about the cosmos itself, and the astrology grows out of those assumptions. Right. prior to any testing or uh, you know, correlation of human events with celestial events or anything of that kind. Right. So I would say that Western astrology, insofar as it derives from someone like uh, Eudoxus, is in fact a rational, a highly rational, highly systematic construct. Now some people are going to say that means Eudoxus made it up, <clears throat> and to some extent, I'm saying that that's true. But if, in fact, he had a true cosmology, then that would give, uh, uh, that would provide for the possibility of a valid astrology. Yes, and I mean, and this is in some ways typically Greek, in that it's, it's, high, it's uh, entirely Greek. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> In terms, it's recognizably so. In terms of it being a super duper left brain, yes, this is not any yes, kind no. of intuitive thing like the Babylonians are doing. No, well, there, theirs isn't intuitive. The Babylonian is it's almost observational. entirely in, observational, but it's environmental. Yes. They're they're it, they're yeah. they're, harm, they're they're looking at their environment and tuning into their environment, which is, I guess, yes. intuitive is not the right word for that. Uh, this stands apart from the environment. Yes, this, this originates in cosmological speculation. And the, so I'm saying that concepts like, um, you know, the planetary sect, you know, the divi this very characteristic division um, of the seven classical planets into two groups, uh, which does not have any apparent astronomical justification. You mean day and night uh, planets? Day, day and night planets. So Mars, uh, Mars, Venus, and the Moon mm. are nocturnal planets, and Saturn, Jupiter, and the Sun are diurnal planets. Yeah. And they are they are two sects, like uh, political factions, religious sects. Mm -hmm. That's what the Greek word means. So there are these two camps of planets, <clears throat> and they have very different. Um, uh, as sects, they espouse, you might say, very different principles, and those principles divide the, the sects in, into into the two camps that they uh, that the planets belong in. Now, this I maintain that this particular classification of the planets 
stems directly from this, from cosmological considerations. It isn't even immediately justifiable uh, astronomically. It, it isn't an order, a planetary order or a planetary grouping that you could immediately infer just by uh, studying the heavens. Mm -hmm. And uh, another claim of mine is that the association of the four physical elements with the uh, what modern people would call the the triplicities, the you know, in other words, Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius are fire-like signs. Mm -hmm. Taurus, Virgo, and <clears throat> and Capricorn, um, Earth-like signs. That those designations, those associations of the triplicities with the four physical elements, also directly come out of Eudoxus's work. So it is uh, concepts of those kind um, are not in any way derived from experience. They are uh, they are highly rational concepts that come and derive ultimately from a cosmology that I say Eudoxus himself was responsible for. So the other thing that goes along with this, excuse me just a minute, Eric. Go ahead, go ahead. No, please do. My, my. <coughs> um, the, the reason that I started thinking in this direction about a founder or a, uh, the way I used to put it, um, one man or a small group of men working according to a common program, the reason that I began to search, you might say, for the founder or founders is because um, Greek astrology, Hellenistic astrology, is highly systematic. The concepts don't just stand uh, in isolation from one another. They're all tied together in this very, very intimate way. Now, there are people um, who deny that this is the case, <clears throat> but they simply don't know what I know. Um, I've been convinced of this for many, many years, and per um, particularly over the past several years, I've confirmed this uh, to an extent that I could hardly have imagined even when I began to get the idea. So my reasoning was very simple. If you have something that is this systematic, um, a system of astrological concepts that are so tightly integrated, um, it must have been the result, the, the introduction, the development of the astrology must have been the work of one man or a group of men working to, uh, according to a common program. Mm -hmm. How could it have been, become uh, that systematic, if that were not the case. So, I've been, you know, I've been singing that particular song for many, many years. Now I find, I feel like I've finally uh, found the founder. So, what can you say about? And I, you know, I recognize that you're you're not going to r reveal all of your clues, but what can you tell us that would support the idea? This okay, yep. this co cogency of the system that is yes, that's good, one a good clue. I mean, that, that is a clue, yeah. But I can also say, and because I, I said this as much in the announcement that we put out, um, <clears throat> Eudoxus was the, the man who first assigned the planetary or the, the, the names of the 12 signs, gave them the Greek names. Now, there may have been some assignments uh, that had been made prior to e Eudoxus's day, and if, if they are in the system of names, it just means he accepted them. Um, but there are n several uh, conspicuous examples of names of the signs which bear no resemblance whatsoever to their Babylonian counterparts, uh, such as Pisces for the Babylonians is the swallow's tail or tails. They don't know for sure whether it was plural, where in Greek it's the fishes, yep. Pisces. And, and then you have Aries, uh, which for the Babylonians is something like the, you know, the hired hand or the hireling or something like that. Uh, but in Greek,
Greek, it's the ram. Now, I'm saying that those names were first assigned or at least accepted or approved by Eudoxus. And there's general scholarly consensus about this. This isn't anything I'm making up. If you look in a Greek lexicon for the Greek names for the signs, you will find that the earliest references to those names are, in fact, um, found in a commentary by Hipparchus um, where he has verbatim quotations of um, statements made by Eudoxus in a, a lost work called The Phenomena. So the earliest names for the, the signs are, in fact, found in this work of Hipparchus, where he refers specifically to Eudoxus's, uh, the names that Eudoxus gave them. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> the if you study, and this is the thing I'm not going to go into detail in here, um, if you study the spelling, the spellings in Greek of those names, um, you you see implicit in the spellings, either individually or when the different names in their Greek form are compared with one another, um, you see, for instance, a structure emerging which is like that of the four elements and other such matters. <clears throat> so you could say that the, the, the evidence is to some extent in the names themselves which I find kind of interesting because it means as long as, as, long as the names survived, uh, there would be some um, hope of recovering uh, a lot of this astrological doctrine. So that is uh, largely the approach that my wife and I have been following for a number of years now, and it has been very fruitful. So um, I am writing this material up. I actually have written most of it up, and I'm trying to put it together here in book form, and I hope it will be out uh, fairly shortly. And then, you know, the, the storm of uh, the storm will be <laughs> how that doesn't prove anything, you know, that kind of thing, yeah. and which I'm expecting will happen. Um, but I actually have quite a lot of proof beyond what I just alluded to. And so I will not be able to put one publication out that, that uh, outlines all of my arguments. I'm going to have to do this in a sequence of monographs, and that's what I intend to do in the near future. So, uh, and there are mathematical arguments and other arguments. So I'm yep. sorry to be so... Uh, um, um, reticent about it, but it's, it's something I have to be, um, I have to be careful about what I say and how I say it until I can actually publish the material. <clears throat> yeah, I get it. And I mean, it's, this is, it's not like it's an implausible uh, theory on its face. You know, it's certainly um, more plausible than uh, some ship came from Atlantis. <laughs> Well, it's more it's more plausible to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and look, I mean, nothing against the Atlanteans or anything. Um, right. So they have their own problems, right? So yeah. So just to sum up, th- there is observation going on in by the uh, Chaldeans mm-hmm. in in what's ca- called Babylon. That's the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. That's yes. where that's going on. That's right. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they're you know they're not. Dumbasses, they're they're looking up and they they want to they want to know what's they want to know too what's going right. on, right? And and in in parallel, of course, this has been going on for a long time. So the Greeks yeah. somehow found out about this. Yeah, that's and, right. And like like the Greeks do, they wanted to put things in order. Yes, or as um, um, is said in Plato's Epinomus. Um, well, you know, sure, we Greeks get things from other cultures. We just make them better. <laughs> right. Um, you take that for whatever it is, but it, is, um, it was a Greek attitude. Um, so there, there were obviously some other indigenous astrologies going on, concurrent with, um, you know, with the classical period in, 
in Greece. It's, um, but they are not rational, highly rational, cosmological astrologies, as far as I can tell, or as far as anybody has said, yes. up, at least up to this point. So there, there's a, a striking difference right at that point. Now, one of the difficulties that I had um, was there is a uh, striking statement by Cicero in his treatise on divination, where he says that, that Eudoxus rejected the Chaldean ways or gave no credence to the Chaldean ways of trying to predict a man's life from his birth date. Yeah. Now, uh, historian of mathematics Thomas Heath uh, uh, for, takes this as a statement, um, as he put it, that Eudoxus was a true man of science and wouldn't have anything to do with superstitious nonsense like astrology. So this very, very striking statement by Cicero. On the other hand, there is a statement that was actually found by one of my students, dug out, uh, uh, who was researching Zoroastrianism. There is a uh, statement in, a, in, in the Roman, uh, work of the Roman naturalist Pliny that Eudoxus considered the magic art to be superior to all other arts. So here we have, now, th this is in the context of Persian magic, which includes three disciplines. One of them is medicine, the, the other is religion, and the third is astrology. When so, is this, in, in the timeline, where, when is uh, Persian magic developed in comparison to the founding it, era? It would have been, <laughs> it would have been, um, uh, this is a statement by, you know, attributed to Eudoxus. Eudoxus was born on the island of Tenidos, which is sort of in the, on the shores of Asia Minor, uh, in what, close to what today would be Turkey. And, but he traveled everywhere. He obviously traveled to Persia. And the, the priests or the, the Magi um, had a practice and it involved some form of astrology. And Eudoxus was clearly aware of this, and this would have been a practice going on earlier than, uh, than Eudoxus's time. And so Eudoxus evidently approved of what they were doing. So the way to reconcile these two statements would be, yeah, Eudoxus rejected Babylonian astrology. He didn't reject astrology, yeah, ba Babylonian astrology, which could mean simply that he rejected an astrology that was based entirely on empirical correlations. But it does not rule out the possibility that he, in fact, um, uh, through his cosmological speculations, was trying to develop an astrology, and that's my claim. Yeah, and so he's going. He he's he wants to go from kind of. Um the theory forward, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, he wants to. He wants everything to be on the firmest, uh, give it the firmest grounding possible, which he would see as coming out of a cosmology. Yep. And and by the way, um, uh, as an astronomer, Eudoxus was the first person to give a an account of the the irregular motions of the uh, of the planets. Uh, through a geometrical model called the theory of the concentric spheres. So he would have each planet um, uh, uh, being placed on, s simultaneously on sev several spheres that were moving in different ways, and that would account for the aberrant motions of the planets and phenomena like retrogradation. So he was the first man in history to ever do that. So, um, and by the way, the other, the other thing... Um, that Diogenes Laertius tells us uh, is that Eudoxus gave lectures on the cosmos, I'm saying he certainly would have been interested in cosmology, on the gods and on the celestial phenomena. So, I mean, we know that Eudoxus was active in, in those directions. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
So, this so far this makes sense to me, it, and it 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 aligns with everything we've talked about previously. But one thing I didn't mention, by the way, is that there's a lot of different versions of quote unquote classical astrology going around. Going around, you have stuck with Greek astrology all through. Yes. Uh, 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 it seems like about a 25-year, how long, research phase? Um, well, we started Project Hindsight in 1993, yep. and um, I, I was doing the Greek translations and uh, editing some of the Latin ones, at, at least not initially, but a little bit later. And But I've always thought that the way of trying to understand something is to go back to the beginnings. Um, a fa favorite quote, quote of mine is that great ideas have great beginnings you know, by Heidegger. I've used that on a number of occasions. And so it's also just part of my training to, uh, to go back to the sources, I mean, and, and try to read the original source texts and then try to understand the development of some discipline prospectively rather than retrospectively, which might so seem paradoxical given the fact that the project was called Hindsight. But <laughs> anyway... Um, it sounds like so, you're dealing with formal cause here. Uh, well, um, I, I should say uh, part of the reason um, that I make some of the kind of pronouncements, I guess some people would think of them as that, um, about... Greek astrology or Hellenistic astrology, as opposed to later developments, is that I'm, I'm sort of in a unique position because I didn't come to astrology having learned modern astrology. I learned astrology by translating Greek texts. So, um, so my I I tend to see all later developments in, in Western astrology through the lens of Greek astrology, whereas other people are trying to see Greek astrology as the, you know, the um, antecedent or something to modern developments. So, you know, I've been, uh, I have almost entirely, I've devoted almost all my efforts to the Greek material. Yep. Um, I mean, uh, there is there are interesting things in the medieval tradition, and of course, the medieval astrologers were heavily dependent uh, on their Greek on the Greek sources. And but it's always seemed to me, you know, why read derivative things when you have access to the uh, to some level at least have access to the original sources. Yeah, and so, that was the whole purpose of Project Hindsight. I mean, that's right. there, there was not, I mean, we take for granted the fact now that there's translations of things. There were not good translations prior to Project Hindsight. Even William Lilly worked with mistranslations of Ptolemy. Yeah. Well, my translations were not perfect when I started them either. Um, the, no, we had never, nobody had ever really encountered anything like this. I mean, Ptolemy's, uh, you know, Tetrabiblos had been ch translated, and Manilius's uh, astron uh, his, his work had been uh, translated. But right from the outset, we were discovering ma material that was almost entirely unknown, mm -hmm. just kind of unheard of. Um, I mean, distinctions, you know, for instance, the, the whole sign places or whole sign houses, which we can come back to if you like, and uh, all kinds of timing uh, procedures, uh, Western equivalents to the Hindu dashas, you know, all kinds of things that we found. But, the, um, it, but it was so difficult to um, uh, get under control because it seemed to be headed in all kinds of different directions. There didn't seem to be um, any real uh, consistency, you know, and particularly, in, and in particular, you couldn't find any explicit statements about cosmology or theoretical underpinnings or anything. They, they seem to be almost entirely just practical manuals for you know how to do astrology. So it was it was perplexing, uh, but there was enough there. Um, even from the beginning, to give me some sense that uh, underneath all of this, uh, 
was something coherent. Um, and I had to find a way of accessing that level in these uh, treatises that appeared to be simple, practical manuals for, you know, for the practice of astrology. So then over the years, um, over the years, I began to notice things um, that there were certain compositional devices, in Greek compositional devices, that seemed to be used quite frequently, and th they would be puzzling. You would have, you know, two like parallel constructions, um, but they weren't quite parallel. <laughs> you know, they're obviously set up to be parallel, but they're they're not just uh, repeating identically what uh, what what the one phrase, for instance, would be saying. And so I started pushing on those. And I realized that this was, in fact, a form of encryption. And the in, encryption isn't quite the right word. It was these the early texts, not all of the later commentaries in, in Greek, but the earliest source texts have this very strange, this unique signature composed in a very special way that is intended uh, that they're composed in such a way that the the careful reader or the one who's willing to spend enough time with the text will in fact snag on things inconsistencies sometimes things that look like you know they're downright contradictions um, other other just peculiarities and excuse me I've still got some problem here in my chest <coughs> So I slowly began to realize that these compositional devices were intentional. And you, the material is actually being presented to you almost like a puzzle. And you have to puzzle it out, and then you understand what the author is saying. And the, it, this, these devices would serve to... Um, you know, seal the material off from people who were just hobbyists or something, you know, who would just kind of glance at it. <clears throat> but, but it would preserve the original doctrine in, in a very compact form uh, for anyone who, first of all, got wind of the, uh, of the compositional devices and secondly took the time to decode them. Um, and that, of course, is it's very time-consuming, but it's always rewarding. So you'll have some treatise that comes down under the name, for instance, of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, or one of the other legendary founders. And these treatises are all, for the most part, very, very short. There, there might be collections, long collections, large collections of these very short treatises, but they, they can be sometimes, you know, two paragraphs. And the doctrine is being um, communicated through those um, those very short and early texts. Now, <clears throat> astrologers like Vedius Valens in the the second century of the Christian era um, complain openly complain about the obscurity of the of their uh, of the texts that were the source texts of their day. So we're not dealing with people who are writing in a modern essay style here. Um, we, we're, this is a very special kind of writing. It's taken me 23 years to, you know, to open it up, and to some extent, I'm sure there are you know mysteries here that I haven't uh, seen and maybe never will. Um, but one of the terrible mistakes that people are making when they review these texts. When, they're try when they try to study them, is that to read them as though the author was writing on a blog or something. <laughs> no, I mean, seriously. I mean, you know, well, here, that's the way we write. Yeah. Well, put, mm -hmm. this is the way they wrote. Now, but anybody who has really studied Greek writing, Greek texts, philosophical texts, other kinds of texts, realize that, um, you know, Greeks seldom write like that. 
Yeah, I mean, Plato uh, wrote dialogue. Distinction right? from the Greek writing of its day, the other contemporary writing is different. Yeah, it, it's it's completely. Uh, one, one way of doing this is that, or thinking about this, is what did Plato do? He wrote dialogues. Which are designed to treatises. explicate. They're designed to bring out something in a, in a way the mind is accustomed to. And, and in a more conversational way, but at the same time, the dialogues are so carefully constructed that when you go back over them, then you see, gee, I wonder why you know Socrates asked the question in exactly that manner. Mm-hmm. And so the dialogues are designed to to make you think about the subject that's being discussed, not to simply be informed by a doctrine. Okay, I mean, what we do, we go to school, you know, we have a teacher, teacher, you know, teaches us, you know, automobile repair or advanced physics. We get information that we can then imply, you know, apply somewhere. That is not the Greek ideal of teaching. The, um, so Plato wrote dialogues. I mean, but Plato was concerned about what he would call the tyranny of the written word. I mean, you have to remember that that it was sort of within Pla- within Plato's memory, or shortly before Plato's own time, that people actually started writing books. Yeah. I mean, writing books. And, and I mean, there were teachers, and but then all of a sudden, people are writing books. So you know, this is a phenomenon uh, in in Plato's day. Books are being written. Plato stands back and looks at this. Is this a good idea? Yes. You know, to have written books. So he wants to write in such a manner as to uh, avoid the tyranny of the written word by using devices from, from, like, ordinary conversational discourse, but using them in a very clever manner uh, to to get the reader or the student to actually think something through himself rather than simply be spoon-fed and told what, you know, what the case is. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I have the, the, this issue all the time with, you know, with Project Hindsight because I'm dealing with these difficult texts and I have a course, uh, you know, I'm teaching uh, Greek astrology, but the tendency in the astrological world is, oh, well, just give me the techniques, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, how many times have you heard that? And, but I feel, because I had this experience in reading these texts, I had to decode them. I learned something that I would not have learned or understood if the material had been simply presented to me in essay form. Yep. Now, if I'm a responsible teacher, I have to somehow recreate that experience for my students. I, I, I can't just, you know, oh, here it is. Here's, here's what you do. Now you, you do this, and you apply that, and you do this timing thing, and you get X result. The, the, the difficulty is that, that I think that, that this Greek astrology has enormous potential. It's not easy. And puzzling through the texts, you know, wh- why should one bother to go, you know, why should anyone have to go through the agonizing process of uh, decoding, decrypting, um, why can't they just have the results? Well, it is my view that <laughs> these cryptic um, devices are there. You have to go th- you know, th- through all these hoops because when you're doing that, you are getting training. Your mind is being trained yeah. in such a manner that you will need when you actually try to read charts. Yeah. You remember, um, you're old enough to uh, remember the wax on, wax off episode. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh-huh. th- this is the I'm wax trying, on, trying wax to... off part. You don't know that you're being, you're being taught astrology when you read these things. You just, you, you're just, you know, getting a headache from trying to read something. Yep. So, um, so I find that actually a very elegant way uh, of teaching, I mean, the way I was taught by reading the text, and to some extent, or as much as possible, I have to recreate that experience for people I'm teaching. 
instead of just giving them the techniques. So, so how do you do that? You know, what's an idea of, of how you do that? Well, I'm not, I'm not um, requiring people to go through and read the Greek text, although I'd be happy to, you know, if I, I do have one student who loves doing this kind of thing as much as I do. But in the course that I present, I, it's not easy. I, I don't, I, I, it's not that I'm making it difficult for the simple purpose of being difficult. I have to present material in a certain order, uh, um, not always put it the way people would expect it. These, uh, the, the course is in, is, you know, in audio. So I have people by now sort of broken in, and they, you know, they, they pride themselves. Well, I listened to that section five times, you know, and I think I still have to go back over it again. Yeah. So th- they're getting some, a, a different kind of training uh, than, than the, the simple formal instruction on how, how to read a chart. And most of them seem to respond to it fairly well. I may, you know, occasionally go overboard, and uh, I think I have maybe lost a few people, <laughs> along the line, but but I do not feel it is responsible to teach this material in any other way, and I'm still trying to perfect the you know the, the other devices that I can use when I'm when I am presenting it. Yeah. So um, anyway, th- this is you know this is my own view. Um, I'm not you know I'm not necessarily recommending it to anybody else, but this this is what I think is responsible. A responsible way to teach the material, I mean, particularly this Greek material, because you also have to. I, I, I teach a lot of philosophy along with this because you have to. Um, you you have to be able to see. You have to be able to see the astrology through the eyes of a Greek. I mean, it's not just separable from you know from the the metaphysical presuppositions that uh, that guided. The development of the astrology in the mm-hmm. first place. Yep. You have, you know. So, well, you know me well enough that, that I, you know any opportunity to talk about metaphysics, right? <laughs> so. it's, and it's based on a worldview. You're saying, and that that yes. worldview needs to be understood. Uh, yes. As as part of understanding the astrology. I mean, one of the biggest critiques I have of people who are kind of bandying about with classical astrology and making declarative statements about people's lives in the 21st century based on you know second century or whatever doctrines yeah. is is that the the world view is so radically different yes science has changed so much yes uh, th- there have been legitimate discoveries of science since yes. the and mathematics mm-hmm. yeah uh, quantum is a real thing relativity is a real thing mm-hmm and these, uh, the, these, though they are somewhat transparent, feed our worldview. Yes, they do. And so we are, we are kind of living in the polyverse. Yeah, that's a good and, way to put it. <laughs> and we know that space and time are not absolute, even, even if we've never read <laughs> special relativity. Uh, the, Einstein's discoveries impact our lives. Yes, they do. And so we are taking all of this... In the in the much wider field context of the of, of our li- our lives that we live, and I think that has to be done gently. I think it has to be done consciously, with the perils acknowledged. You mean in, in trying to apply traditional astrological interpretation to the modern world? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 We have. <clears throat> okay. And, um, and what I okay. Say, if you, you yeah. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. That you have, no, you, you have options. Or your clients have options that that people didn't have. Yes. In in that in that day. Yes. That, that our our lives are much less predictated. Yes. Than than uh, twenty five hundred years ago. Certainly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have psychology. We have the ability to understand motives. We have other ways to get answers to to questions that did not exist in in. In uh, for the fourth century BC, right, and all of those differences need to be taken into account before we make a pronouncement about someone's Mars in fall and how bad their life is going to be because they've got Mars in 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 in, in fall. 
um, I, I would that, never. That, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Things, uh, I, for sure. I, I want to. If they these these things raise revolution in my heart when I hear the things that have been said uh, to people based on some misunderstood pronouncement fr from uh, some ancient rule. The um, remember, I said that you know that these texts were written in such a way as to make you think, uh, mm -hmm. think through something. Mm -hmm. um, that part's important. The, <laughs> the the objection, the objection that I have to, uh, I'll, I'll just be frank to what uh, to, uh, other traditional astrologers are doing, is they have not penetrated to the level of the principles. Um, they they will be when when they offer a delineation, for instance, it will be based uh, ultimately or prompted by some uh, some astrological cookbook of early times, because there are such, you know, well, let's look at, you know, Saturn configured with the sun, Saturn configured with Jupiter, you know, I mean, you know, run down the list, it means such and such, it means such and such. Okay, now, the, if you just consult one of those uh, uh, delineation texts, you're going to get results that, that, you know, will have no that would not be valid in a person's life, not simply because times have changed, but because those delineations, those source texts, were never meant to be used that way. They look like they're, they're modern cookbooks, but they were never meant to be used that way. I maintain that despite all the changes that have occurred in the modern world, that if you understand the principles, the principles behind this original astrology of the West, it will still have a, a, applicability. Now, I cannot say um, co with complete assurance that this astrology works across the board. Nobody can say that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I do have one thing that, that gave me quite a bit of confidence was this work that I did on one of the um, the timing procedures in the in the Greek material, releasing, which was which zodiacal, releasing. zodiacal releasing. Yeah. Now I spent a lot of time with that, and I realized that if I mean I never had a failure with it. Now what do I mean by that? I wasn't telling you know people that they were going to get fired from their job the next week, or I, I never made statements like that. But what I did see is the use of that technique. Um, word that I don't like much anymore, the word technique, by the way. But anyway, um, that it, if you look at it from the point of view of how you see a structure to your life, almost like it's an astrological biography, if you use it for that purpose, it doesn't fail, which was interesting to me. The only failure I ever had with it was a woman who was lying about her birth time and, and the events in her life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the chart didn't make any sense. No, oh, seriously, oh, well. <laughs> didn't make really it didn't make any that. sense at all. But the there are charts that are harder, uh, and charts that are easier. But the structure can be seen. But what I was doing there is something quite different than just doing a fresh reading of the chart. I was trying to apply the very same timing procedure to the entirety of one person's life. And in other words, from you know from birth up to wherever they were when 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 they came to see me, and my statement, and I told everyone that whose chart I ever read, and I say, do it to this day. I have no business trying to take a peek into what might be forthcoming in your life if I can't make sense of your life up to this point. With the, you, in other words, using the same technique, I have yes. no business. I mean, it would be unethical, really. And but you know, the realities of astrological readings. And all, you know, well, I've got you know, got an hour to spend on this chart. I mean, yeah. to me, that's to, to me, that's ridiculous. Well, Diana Stone, yeah. I've, you're the only only the second astrologer I've ever heard say that. Diana Stone was the first. I walked into one of her lectures at uh, at a conference, and she said, "I caught ju just as she was saying." If if you have one hour with the client and 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 you have to take fifty five minutes to figure out what the heck is going on with them and and then you do the reading in five minutes, you take that fifty five minutes and figure out what's going on with them. Yeah, 
And I developed a technique using Chiron transits, where if I have someone coming in, I know they've got a complex situation, I can spot check a, a, a little club, because I've got a lot of practice now, I, I know where to look, and maybe check three or four Chiron events that look really intense, and hear yeah. from them how their chart responds when you turn up the juice. Yeah. And th this is just a way to orient on the, on the person's story arc, on their trajectory. Mm -hmm. to see, you know, w what they're likely to do under similar stressful situations. So yeah. that's, th that is, I, I think, th thank you for using this highly responsible approach, y you know, even, you, you know, the, the, with the depth that you have an understanding of these techniques. I would love to learn the zodiacal releasing thing just f just for the fun of it. Um, it I, I, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. It, it's, it's a crazy looking thing. It doesn't. It uses a 360-day year, you know. Wow. I mean, and all kinds of other peculiarities. Yeah. But I've I've read quite a few charts with it. You know, some you know I have in fact gotten paid for a few of them. But I've read for friends, but also lots of celebrity charts or outstanding individuals. Mm -hmm. And I was astonished at you know how well it works. But it's a huge amount of work. When I you know, if if I'm going to read someone's chart, I don't have much time to do this really. But when I do, I get a biographical sketch from them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they have to provide this, mm -hmm. you know, to me. Yep. And it it can take me, you know, the first day I get the biographical stuff. I you know I look I've got the chart I've got the the time periods you know printed out in front of me, and I look at I look at the chart and I you know. I look at this and I just see a blur. Then maybe the next day, then I start, you know, then I can also start asking the person some questions. Um, in, you know, material that they didn't provide, oftentimes important events in their life that they've frankly just forgotten. You know, I mean, yep. it happens all the time. And then, so I actually am like crafting a kind of biography yep. for these yep. people. And if I can't do that, uh, then I'm not going to say anything about yep. what's forthcoming. Mm -hmm. But this can take days worth of work. Yes. Okay. Now, which means, you know, I you know I can't do this for you know whatever the going rate, you know, is for reading a chart. So it's it that's the downside of this. On the other hand, I believe that we you know through this process I get real results. Yep. Real results. And but it boy it takes time. And there may be ways to, I don't want to say shortcuts, but like holographic methods of, of, of using core principles from this that sum it up. Um, say what you mean by that again? Well, I'm saying let's say you're able to identify several of the, several of the core principles operating within the zodiacal releasing yes. method. Yep. You may be able to do a kind of a, um, you may be able to s make it more succinct. It may, it may be another level of refine. Like all technologies, can go through refinements. Sure. Uh, that still and they still work just fine. New transistors work just as well as the old ones did, if not yeah. far better. Yeah. So while we while we're while we're on, you know, a uh, couple of more. Can I bring up a, a different topic? Sure. Sure. Theme of Monday. So this yes. is where we started our conversation about this, and uh, I love this thing, and it's so elegantly, deceptively simple. Is 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 the theme of Monday? Uh, do you think the product of the mind of Eudoxus? Yes, I do. Okay, um, so I can't prove that, of course. Uh, the 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 theme of Monday in Firmicus Maternus, who's one of our source texts writing in Latin, um, uh, explicitly says that um, the the theme of Monday was presented, you might say. To Nekepso and Petosphorus, two of these important, you know, uh, founding people, um, by um, Asclepius, who was um, uh, had this doctrine transmitted to him by Hermes. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so you have you have a lineage here. Yep. You've got Hermes Trismegistus, and then you have. Um, this Asclepius person, and then a person uh, named Anubio, and they're sort of the founders. I see, I see uh, Asclepius and Anubio as, as probably uh, student, direct students or successors of, um, of Hermes.
they presented this material, they presented it according to legend to Nicapso and Pythagoras, somewhere evidently in the second century BC, or maybe you know even later. Now, everybody thinks of that just as some you know some uh, kind of. Uh, that that Nikepso and Pythagoras would say something like that to give their own writing more authority by invoking some semi-divine uh, uh, source for it, and that's what people, modern people, cynical people, uh, tend to think. I actually think that this may be um, a somewhat, uh, perhaps, uh, colorful um, record of an actual report of an actual event that took place. Mm -hmm. And using pen names here, Asclepius is not the god of medicine. Yeah, it's yes, a pen it, name. It, it is. It, it, it is that guy? Yes, yes. Greek Wait, god so of... Asclepius was a, a person, not a god. Well, <laughs> we have people who, well, Hermes is a, you know, is a god, too. You know, so you have these sort of theophoric names, which are fairly common in Greek, um, associated with these legendary founders. But there is a person, let's say this, one of the founders is called Asclepius. That's his name. Yeah. It could be a nom de plume. Uh, could be his I mother named know. him, his mother called him Asclepius because she liked doctors? It could be that. <laughs> could be anything like that. Uh, and we may doctor. never know. Be a doctor. But, as the the uh, the legend has it, then as what we have in um, Firmicus Maternus is Hermes um, transmits this doctrine, which involves the Thema Mundi, uh, to Asclepius, who who then revealed it, so to speak, to Nicepso and Pythagoras, who then published it. Yeah. The we Latin should... verb there is edo, which we get the word edit from it, just to give out. Mm -hmm. So, it, okay, so that, that is an account of where the fame of Mundi came from. It's passed along and finally published. That's and right. And it's published in this era of where, where the mystery school, as I call it, is, is revealed in the second century. Yes. BC. That's right. We should mention what this Thema Mundi thing is, right? It, yes. It's a chart. It's, a, yes. it's, a, it's, a, it's an astrological figure. Yes. Uh, and and in, the, in, the, in the Eudoxus version, uh, Cancer is in the ascendant, 15 degrees. Yes. And the, and the moon is in the first house. Um, what are you calling house? <laughs> uh, yeah, place. I guess. Uh, well, the moon. No, no, in... no. I, I don't mean the, the term. Um, yeah, y you've got a. You have a c cancer rising yeah. with the moon at fifteen degrees on the ascendant of ah, that the chart. The moon is is at fifteen. So the moon and the ascendant are are considered yes. to be at fifteen degrees. Yes. Okay. So and th and then the other planets are in their domiciles. So the the sun or the sun is in Leo at fifteen degrees, and 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 then you know Mercury in Virgo at fifteen degrees, and so forth. And this takes us around to, uh, s s well, let's see, let's let's go through them. Second second place is is uh, Sun and Leo at fifteen. Third yeah. place Mercury Virgo, fourth place Venus Libra. Fifth right. place, uh, oops, I'm like, Mars, Mars Scorpio. Scorpio, followed mm -hmm. by uh, sixth, which is Sag and um, Jupiter. Mm -hmm. Where is Saturn in this? Saturn in Capricorn. In the, it's in the seventh. In the seventh. Hold on, let me get. And on. then, and then we start moving backwards, because we also have. Not in one chart, ah, but, but yes, we're told yes, 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 yes. we're told that Aquarius um, is also uh, belongs to Saturn. Yep. And then we go backwards: Pisces to Jupiter, uh, Mars, Aries, and so forth. Yeah, and and so one of the cool things about this is that it it organizes the cosmos with the, the Moon and the Sun uh, associated with Cancer and Leo, and exactly opposite them are two Saturn oriented right. signs and then it spreads out Jupiter Jupiter Mars Mars 
Tor- Venus, Venus, Mercury, Mercury, and then right. the moon and the sun. So it's this lovely, symmetrical device. Yes, and another way of putting it is the, two, the domiciles of the two lights are opposite the two dom- domiciles of Saturn. The, the domiciles of um, Venus are opposite the domiciles of Mars. The domiciles of uh, Jupiter are opposite the domiciles of Mercury. Yep. So, so there is a striking symmetry in this, um, and so that is there is just a simple bit of doctrine of lore um, in that Thema Mundi in the assignment of planets to their respective signs that in Greek are called their domiciles. Yes, um, it's a perfectly elegant, simple, seemingly simple mandala. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that, okay, so this device is, first of all, Thema Mundi. What does that actually mean? It, it means a Thema is like something put or placed. It, it's a, um, um, actually, Thema Mundi is, is a Latin. It, mean, it would just mean chart of the world. Yes. Like well, Mundus it, Mundi. So it doesn't actually mean that the world was born and, and no. these things were there. I've, I've understood this as being more of a teaching device, an it, allegorical it, teaching yes. device. Yeah. Uh, and a summation. It's kind of the super simplified table of essential dignities, which would seem to follow from this. Many, many things do follow. Um, the, but you're right to say that it sort of uh, encapsulates or sums up a lot of lore. And um, at, so, at some point, I'm going to actually write a monograph. There, there are a lot of really, really subtle things uh, con- connected in the the thing of Mundi, I'll just give you one. Um, in, in Greek astrology, the, there are groupings of successive signs or successive houses, but it is different than the way modern astrologers do this sort of after Rudyard. Um, so, for instance, the... Uh, what? Okay, I'll, I'll try to translate this in the, into modern jargon um one one grouping with the signs is the what modern people call the mutable sign the the next card cardinal sign and then the fixed sign yeah okay now greeks have different words for them and in fact these modern terms are not good terms at all in my opinion but that's neither here nor there so those three signs create are a group it's it's not the cardinal sign, the fixed sign, and the following mutable, okay, like we get from Rudyard and other people. In other words, th- there is a, a kind of unitary character about the, um, the cardinal sign and the two flanking signs, one of which is fixed and the other one's mutable. Yeah. Th- okay, so you have four, um, four of these qua- you know, quadrants right. in, a, in, in a given chart. All right, now, there is something similar um, in the houses, which I normally just call places, yeah. uh, the, where you have what modern people would call the cadent place, mm-hmm. and then you have the angle, so to speak, and then you have the succeeding sign. So that would be, like, for example... Like 9, 10, about, and 11. Yeah, so Go ahead. we're talking about... Uh, so if we do 9, 10, and 11, that's the ninth house is the... Succeeding and the and the tenth is the angular because it's no no the the ninth is sorry cadent. sorry sorry cadent yeah, apologize yeah, yeah. followed by succeeding followed by cadent Taurus for example and that little group is up on the top of the Thema Mundi Pisces Aries that's right Taurus. You, you've got it now, in other words the a a grouping uh, I call these angular triads for reasons of my own okay a grouping that is indigenous to the realm of the places or the houses is um, superimposed on a grouping that is um, indigenous to the signs. In the Thema Mundi, they, they, they're they lined up. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I figure this out from using the Thema Mundi. <laughs> okay, good. So um, another thing about the Thema Mundi is the, what I call the 90-degree shift. Yeah. Uh, that typically we think of Aries as being the first house and Tar- Taurus as being the second and so forth. Once you start looking at the theme of Monday for a while, you realize, well, the, these people put Cancer on the first house. Yes. And, and so that shifts everything 90 degrees. And That's right. 
from the, the way that we're taught from the Zip Dobbins, Dane Rudyard approach. Yeah, that, to, that approach has absolutely no historical precedent. Uh, and, of course, that's important to me. Okay, I mean, yes, and it's important it, to know it, that. It's, ma- even it's if made it up in the 20th century, because a lot of people don't know that. Um, I mean, a lot of people really still think that, like, you know, Greek astrology is somehow similar to modern astrology, and that modern astrology inherited uh, most of its concepts from uh, earlier astrology, which is to some extent true, except there's a whole lot that's just made up in the 20th century. I mean, I mean there, are, there isn't any other way of describing it, and yep. that this is one of them. Yes. And, uh, and I also do not care for that alignment for other reasons, which, it, you know, Aries equals first house equals Mars. I mean, the, 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 there are differences between the places and the signs and the planets. Um, the signs in Greek astrology do not have topics associated with them, the way planets signify things. And, the, and there are no topics. Signify things. And houses, houses signify. also signify things. Yeah. But but to say this is is to, is to assume say that Aries has a Mars like character, or that what you can say about Mars you can also say about Aries, and mm-hmm. and that that in my opinion was a disaster for for modern astrology. Um, well, I mean, a, I, I must say, I mean, I need to qualify that remark. I mean, I'm going to start, you know, being opinionated here, which I won't be able to help. But the um, modern astrologers don't think the way ancient astrologers did, because what, what they do is they think of something that kind of makes sense to them, and then they try it out. And then... If it, if it works a couple of times, it becomes a technique that they regularly use. And un- unfortunately, this, this is what happens so much in modern astrology, that people anachronistically suppose that that's how the, you know, the astrology was developed in ancient times. You know, some Greek, you know, with time on his hand, uh, just, you know, d- decides, well, gee, um, I wanna, uh, I'm, I'm going to connect these two planets with a line, and that looks kind of like the side of a square. Aha, this is a technique. Um, I'm going to try it out in charts. I, I mean, you know, that, as I said earlier, uh, Greek astrology was just highly rational construct. Now, it was developed. Or made up. I mean, it was. De- I mean, it was constructed, but it was constructed following some very, very sophisticated metaphysical principles, and there wasn't anything fuzzy about them. Yep. So, but but all of these developments in modern astrology. I mean, I, I literally don't know what to say about them. Um, anyway, I stubbed my toe. My, 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 toe my prejudice on... is. Yeah, yeah, right. On the day the Go planet on. was discovered, I stubbed my toe, and therefore it must involve Pisces. Yeah, there you go. Um, I've right. actually read that from. Yeah, you have. Okay. I have read that. I would okay. be embarrassed to have made that up myself. Now, the <laughs> groupings of one of the ways I think about the signs, because I do a lot of this whole sign work, you know, doing public astrology, as I call it, reading, yeah. doing these readings, is that I think of one sign as really being revealed in that sign and the previous one and the next one as a little group yeah so i figured out that grouping thing where you would look at gemini cancer and leo as one cluster of of concepts basically yeah that that, that harmonize but the most interesting thing about the the theme of monday the 90 degree shift as i call it is it takes us out of uh an identification with the human uh, being or the earth even as Aries rising and it it places can the, all the p- properties uh, vibrational energetic properties associated with the sign cancer on on the first house now I may be applying some modern thinking here but what to you is it saying that the sign cancer is on the first house as opposed to the sign Aries um, the okay let me let me do some more pattern things first yeah. Okay, um, because I'm not sure that I can answer your question in, in the way I, I think you intended it. I'm not sure I can. Yeah. Um, uh, um, okay, look at cancer. 
have cancer, imagine, okay, visualize the exaltation signs. Yes, okay. So what, what are we looking for being exalted? Okay, cancer we have... Cancer is not an exaltation. No, it is, isn't it? Yes, Jupiter. it is. Jupiter is so exalted yeah. in cancer. Right. So let's work uh, backwards. Okay, we have, um, we have the moon exalted in, uh, in Taurus. We have the sun exalted in Aries. We have Venus exalted in Pisces. We have Mars exalted in Capricorn. We have um, uh, Saturn exalted in Libra, and uh, Mercury exalted in Virgo. It rules and exalted. That's an interesting thing because it's both. In the case of Mercury, yes, yes. And, and there are there are reasons for that, but I think um, I could explain at some point. But now look at those. Look at each sign that is an exaltation sign, and look at its relationship to Cancer. Okay, so it's uh, Taurus is sextile, um, and and uh, Virgo is sextile. Yes. Uh, sat, uh, Cap is opposite. Um, yep. Pisces is trine. Mm -hmm. uh, can't, but but Libra is square. Libra is square. Yeah, as as is um, Aries. Uh, Aries is, is the, the sun is exalted. Exaltation of the sun. That's right. Okay. Now, so all, let's all of those signs are connected to to Cancer by the so called classical aspects. Yep. They're all configured, in, in, and, and by the way, the Greeks do not use other configurations like semi-sextiles. And, I get uh, it. No, no, those like are that. much, much, yeah. much later. Yeah. So you're saying. So that, you uh, see, you see that in the Thema Mundi itself, okay. if you put the exaltations in there, you have all the exaltations um, configured, the signs configured with Cancer. That would not be true with Aries. Yeah. Okay, because Virgo, it. for instance, would be connected. And, and, and Pisces and, and Taurus would be adjacent to it. So, you know, so it would not be connected. Now, that's just a pattern, but there are, there are so many patterns of this kind. These are things that are part of my evidence that this was a rational construct. Yep. The, joys okay. of the, the joys are another one of your patterns. Yes, right? that's right. Yeah. So how, how would that look? Okay, you have um, you have Mercury has its joy in the first. Moon has its joy in the third. Um, Venus has its joy in the fifth. Mars has its joy in the sixth. Um, I'm doing joys. Yeah. Okay. Saturn and twelfth. The the. the Pardon me? Saturn, Saturn, in, Saturn in the 12th. Uh, the sun has its joy in the 9th, and uh, Jupiter has its joy in the 11th. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, we do not have all of those configured. Those are not configured to... Uh, they are not configured to cancer, for instance, or to, to the first place in the same manner that the exaltation signs are, yep, yep. okay? All right. They have their own rationale, however, because the two lights have their joys opposite one another, um, namely the ninth and the third. The two benefics um, have their joys opposite one another. Mm -hmm. That's um, uh, Jupiter in, in the 11th and uh, Venus in the 5th, and the two malefics in the 12th and the 6th. Yep. Okay, so we have this very obvious, regular, deliberate pattern there, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, now, so we don't have the configuration to the rising sign, okay, the, the way we do with the exaltations. With the exaltations. Yeah. But if you look at the spatial distribution of the joys relative to the third, which is the joy of the moon, you will see that there is exactly the same spatial distribution. In other words, all of the joys um, are configured to the third in the same way that all the exaltations are configured to the first. Right. Or, or to, to cancer. Yeah, I, I can see you look at this thing saying, gee, someone invented this. 
it, it, it was, it, as I'm saying, and there, it had to have been, and there are, I would say, I have, um, over the years, uh, discovered about, oh, 15 to 25 patterns of this kind. Okay. Really? So, well, yeah. Can you, oh, yeah. Can you give I, me I got one all more that I can work on? Just one more. Um, let's see. Um, let me think of one that I can... Because I'm going to have someone... my hands full studying the exaltations and the joys <laughs> care, carefully. <laughs> and, and then... <laughs> yeah. Um, the, I have quite a few that are going to be put in, in this monograph I'm writing. Um, why don't you just... Uh, take those in for the moment. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah and I've, 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 yeah, good, good, good. That's enough because I've, I've, I've had done some sketches of this, and I've got a couple of marked up Thema Mundi's, uh, but I'll work with those. That's yeah, that's great. And uh, now I've got this other idea of these joining signs being really important. One question I have is, what was the Greek name for the sign Cancer? Carcinos, like I'd, carcinoma. Yep. Okay, I mean, Carquinos is the, the, the name. And, I mean, and it, means, it means the crab. Uh, can also mean pinchers, by, metaphorically. And what was that about? Pardon me? Well, you know, what was... Well, I'm kind of asking two questions at once, which is, what did the Greeks consider a sign to be? Is there even a word for sign in Greek? Yes, there is. And um, <laughs> you, you might remember it was, I used to have um, a T-shirt that was, we were selling, you know, Project Hindsight T-shirts at one point, and I had one specially uh, made for myself that had on the back uh, the question in what? Greek, T-S-D Zeridion. <laughs> What's your the Greek word, the Greek, yeah. <laughs> um, and because that, that word, zoidion, um, is a very strange word to use for what we call signs. Um, and so it was kind of one of my signature themes for years to, you know, to actually lecture on what that word might mean. Um, and the, it, it, the root of the word is zoion which is a word that means either an animal or a picture, like zoology. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the root, uh, the, the zoion. And <clears throat> what happens is it has a diminutive ending on it. So it's, it becomes zoidion, and the idion is the diminutive ending. So I had all kinds of speculations over the years because the zoion root could mean either picture or, or animal. Or living thing, so I, you know, I would riff on this in, in various ways. Now, the easiest thing that, that I could say is that a zoidion, uh, developing the sense of image or representation with the diminutive ending, a zoidion slash sign is a representative representation. <laughs> yeah, it's, In a, other it's words, like a menagerie. It, it's a picture of. It's like postcards of the zoo. It, it's it's more than that. It's the okay the crab. Okay, it is a representation of a terrestrial entity, but it is itself representative of a collection of characteristics. It is a a water like um, sign. It is. A uh, tropical sign, various other characteristics. So, the the the, the sign itself, the zoidion, is a representation of something terrestrial, but for the purpose of representing the collection of characteristics that belong to that sign. And this is this is actually very very subtle uh, doctrine and. Um, and it, it's something, I, I haven't finished my work on this. I, people, even people, particularly people doing traditional astrology, for the most part have been ignoring the special characteristics that belong to the signs. You know, this sign is said to be incomplete. This one is uh, um, um, 
mutilated, this one's terrestrial, you know, this is lascivious, you know, you've got whole collections Who of characteristics. Who gets to be lascivious? Um, <laughs> there's several signs. I hope one of them is I can't remember for, for, for certain, right? Not Pisces, okay. no, not no. Pisces. Uh, so these, these characteristics are, they, part of the problem is you can't see they're not regularly distributed like the four elements. Yeah, and, sure. Right. Yeah, and and there there has to be a principle behind it. Some of them appear to be based on the the characteristics of that terrestrial animal. Okay, some. Okay, like um, you know, uh, Pisces and and uh, and Cancer are said to be prolific signs. Also, uh, Scorpion. And because they have they have lots of offspring, <laughs> you know, right. and and so they're they're said to be prolific or abundant. So there there are certain things, that, certain characteristics that do seem to derive directly from characteristics of the corresponding animal. But then there are other ones that are much subtler, you know. This, this or, or even if they're they're um, derived from something that belongs to the animal. They actually are understood to represent something that you might not expect. So there are um, four-footed animals, mm -hmm. okay, and you know Leo. But what does the word for astrologically? What sense does four-footed have? I mean, you say you know you're, you're not in some delineation that says, well, you're in Leo, so you're going to have trouble with you know with a four-footed animal. It's not that. It's four-footed represents stability. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I meant when I said that these character that what we have here with the, the zoidia, with the, the, the signs, are representative representations. Yeah, got it. And, and that doctrine has to be recovered. And because almost all the texts say, and, you know, you've got to look at the characteristics of the signs, but nobody, nobody knows how to use them. And it's, as a consequence, people just ignore them, you know, when they do readings or when they lecture on the material and so forth. I'm not going to be happy until I understand that. Yeah. Um, now, one of the things I've always thought was a little bit weird is when you read Lily, he describes, you know, the, the physical, you know, pro things associated with Virgo, grain storage place and dairy and all. This sounds more appropriate to a house than to a sign. But, but by whatever seventeenth century, the, the two concepts are becoming interchangeable. The, the this um, the, we're dealing with transformations that occurred, you know, much later in the tradition. You would not find any of that in the Greek material. Part part of the problem is a lot of stuff develops in in later medieval astrology, uh, coming out of mundane astrology which is very poorly re represented in the Greek material. And so, you know, when you, when you start looking at the, you know, the, the whole earth or, or something, then, uh, and you, you still want to use signs and things, you, you have to introduce other types of issues. And some of that stuff with dairy and all that kind of thing that you're saying, some of it might even have been, I don't know this for sure, this is just a wild guess, might have something to do with, back formations of the lots, you know, because you've got all these specialized lots, right. lists, you know, and I, I don't know, they, they may have somehow gotten associated with certain signs for some reason. This is, I am not an expert in that, and uh, don't it. really have an opinion, but we should not blur the distinction between the places and the, and the signs in that way, um, even when using whole sign places. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most useful, which is a whole other conversation, we don't, I don't think we need to go there, um, but like that the, one of the first things a sign gives you is the, the, the planet associated with the sign. So you know, if you've got the south node in the seventh house, uh, w what sign is that south node sitting in? That tells you what planet to look for for information. Yeah, oh, certainly. So first yeah. thing is just a it's just a reference that says okay this is sitting in the sign cancer we've got to look at the moon and, right. and assess the condition of the moon. That's right. To understand that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and that that and the same thing with the place. I mean, if you want to study, you know, you've got a planet in the fifth. You also need to take into account, um, you know, the the ruler of the of that sign, the domicile lord of that sign. So you, you're always getting led to a planet that has a special association with the sign. Yes, you're absolutely right about that. I, yeah. I, mean, I mean, modern astrologers don't do this just like as a matter of course, do they? <laughs> I can't remember anymore. It's been so long. <laughs> even talk to somebody doing modern so. I don't think so. Not as a matter of course. A lot of them are interested in, in, uh, in changing the way they work either. I think that's yeah. a, um, yeah. you know. So a couple of a couple other things. Um, one question I had was about music. What yeah. can you say about uh, the, the development of music theory uh, in parallel or succeeding the development of this astrological theory. Is there any relationship between the two that you can... There is. Um, it, it, again, it, it, one, one work, well, I'll, get, I'll get to that in a second. The, um, do you know much about Greek music theory? A little bit. You mean it, like it, the modes? You mean the, the modes? It's more than that. It's the, the, diff- you know, the different scales. Um, it is a very daunting subject. Well, give me Very an example, because I said highly, theory, highly mathematical. You mean like Pardon the pentatonic me? scale, the Mixolydian scale? No, no, the... no, no, no. I'm talking about the uh, what we would call. Um, it's hard even to make the parallel. Um, here, here's okay. First of all, this work goes way back to Pythagoras. Okay, the, the development of the music scales. Yeah, because he okay. goes. Into, there's the famous scene where he goes into the luthier shop. And and ask him to construct him a device, right? Th- where he can he's, measure he's, the tail. The, he's the, the right. Scales. He's doing experiments with stretch strings. You know, noticing what sound is produced when you stop the string in in, in the middle. You yeah. know, and, and all that. Okay. Now, th- this music theory continues to be developed through the Pythagorean school, um, up to uh, the, the uh, through a man named Archytas of Tarentum who lived in uh, Italy, he was Greek, but lived in Italy. Uh, Archytas of Tarentum was roughly a contemporary with Plato. Mm -hmm. Uh, They knew each other, and for our purposes, what's important is Archytas of Tarentum was the teacher of Eudoxus in geometry and mathematics. Archytas was the teacher? He was the teacher of Eudoxus in geometry and and, uh, evidently, which is, I'm going to claim, music. Archytas um, was a music theorist, uh, introduced um, uh, several different uh, music structures that he called uh, chromatic, di- uh, you know, diatonic, and mixed. Okay, so th- that terminology should begin to kind of, you know, although the, the way it's used is somewhat different. Okay, so wh- this, this is what this is what the Greek musical theorists did, and this, uh, they have enough surviving examples of written uh, songs and things to know that this was also the musical practice of the day. Okay, this was the problem. Uh, you take an octave, and you first of all divide the octave in, into two perfect disjunct tetrachords. So this, for us, would be like C to F and G to, you know, to upper C, all right? But these are perfect tetrachords. We're not doing any uh, well-tempered system here. Okay, so you get two perfect tetrachords. Then the question is, how do you, when you do this, by the way, then you have for um, the, what would be our F and G, you have a perfect interval of nine-eighths. Okay, for the G to the the F in the, you know, the, the higher note in the lower tetrachord and the lower note in the higher tetrachord, mm-hmm. that will give you a perfect nine uh, nine to eight ratio. Now, you take each tetrachord from that point on. You have to do the same thing to both tetrachords, and you have to interpolate two notes in each of the tetrachords in a methodical manner, and that's where it gets to be really highly mathematical. All right. When you interpolate, so, where do you land? 
it, it, you, have, you have to do it. The, the ideal was that the, the intervals between successive notes, as much as possible, should be what are called super particular ratios, which means something like nine eighths, four thirds, three halves, you know, where the, the numerator is one greater than the denominator. Mm -hmm. That was their ideal. So you actually have intervals like 28 to 27, uh, you know, 15 to 14. You have all manner of such intervals. This was th th their ideal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So you have all of the different ways in, in which you can interpolate these super particular ratios b within the extremities of the two tetrachords. This ends up giving you a great variety of, of different scale structures. Now, given one of those structures, the different modes, like the you know, Lydian and Dorian and Phrygian and all that, are simply what note you begin with yes. within one of those given scales. Yeah, okay. one, they're but all they based on like the eight. Ionian scale. They're all just moving the Ionian scale yeah, half steps right. around. That's right. Okay, but there, by the time of Ptolemy, who wrote a work called The Harmonics, uh, by the time of Ptolemy, Ptolemy there were about, well, how many of these were there? I counted them up with me. Um, altogether, I think about 15 or more such scale structures had been introduced mathematically. And... Uh, Maybe not quite that, but quite a few. So you would actually, what do we have? Major and minor, right? And then you have different keys. Well, they had the like a dozen things corresponding to major and minor, and then in each one you would have the different keys. So the the, the material is highly mathematical, um, quite elegant in my opinion. And then I think, ah, strange. Archytas, who was uh, developing this work, was the teacher of Eudoxus. Now, of course, it's not known whether Eudoxus himself um, had, in fact, done, uh, I mean, no report is given that he worked on music theory, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, so I was reading, at one point, a text um, of Paul of Alexandria, which was the very first thing I ever translated, and the text had uh, was referring to uh, that... The, tr the trigon or the trine would have twice the power of this, and and there were all these you know exact numerical statements being made that seemed completely crazy in in an astrological text. I mean, like very very precise numerical. Th and this has the power of this, and this is greater than that. And I remember the very first time I translated that that section, I'm wondering you know what's going on here. The, you know, I mean the, this is an astrological text, isn't it? All right, so yeah. a couple of years ago, I wrote I, I wrote the the precise numerical relationships out, all the ones that were stated, just in the text in, in a s s short uh, sequence of chapters. I wrote those exact mathematical relations down. There were four individual relationships, and there were four unknown things that I was trying to find. I, I, had four, I had four equations, four unknowns. I just so solved them simultaneously, and the numbers that popped out were the numbers corresponding to the, 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 the original Pythagorean scale. Which was what? The Ionian um, it scale? Has, it, yeah, what it does, no, no. What it is is, okay, first of all, you divide the octave into the two perfect tetrachords. So you have the ratio of the upper note, the F-like note, to the C is four-thirds. Okay, so it's four-three. Okay, then if you divided, so to speak, that ratio by nine-eighths, which is uh, the, the central ratio, you get uh, 32 27 If you divide it one more time, uh, you get uh, 256 over 243. All right, those are the numbers that define the Pythagorean scale. So you would have, in, in, in terms of numbers, if you considered the fundamental to be 1, the next note above that would be 256 over two, uh, 243. The, the one after that would be 32 over 27, 
and then the upper note in the tetrachord, tetrachord would be four thirds. So those would correspond to uh, three or to four notes in the tetrachord. Those numbers, those values that I gave you, I told you it's highly mathematical. Yeah. Um, those numbers themselves define the earliest known Pythagorean scale. Those very numbers. So he, right. I was just, I, I, I'm, lo- I, I'm not even after anything musical. I'm simply wondering why there are all these overly precise statements, numerical, quantitative numerical statements being made in an astrological text, and I set them up and I couldn't believe what came out of that. Now, this is a different type of encryption. All right, now you've heard about, you know, the music of the spheres, right? I've heard it. Right? Okay, <laughs> you've heard it, okay. <laughs> All right, well, this is a Pythagorean view. I mean, it's a Pythagorean concept. Mm-hmm. You know, that the, the cosmos is ordered and, and everything's moving around up there and there is the music of the spheres. Now, this is way before the introduction of, or before Eudoxus comes along. So to answer your initial question, there was a highly developed music theory prior to Eudoxus's innovations in the astrology, but I am almost certain that he took them into account. Um, first of all, just this wild thing that I discovered in the Paul text, where I have, I see the Pythagorean uh, scale, and then you start wondering about some of the other concepts, like the the, um, the exaltations and the depressions. Um, the Greeks don't call them fall. Uh, I don't know how that term ever ended up getting in, even into Latin. The Greek word, is, you know, the exaltations and their opposite signs are called their depressions. Right. Uh, in poetic texts, the exaltation will be the throne of a certain planet, and the uh, depression will be a prison, you know, in the poetic texts. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, numerous texts, uh, Greek texts, will... Uh, tell me that when a planet is in its own exaltation sign, um, it there is a uh, an ep, um, uh, epithesis going on. Now, epithesis is a word that initially um, uh, originally has to do with stretching strings. So you stretch the string more tightly, and you get a higher pitch. Um, so there's an intensification of the pitch. So you ha- when a planet is in its exaltation, it is in fact uh, said to be more it, to be intensified. But I maintain, and I haven't finished this work yet, so I probably shouldn't even be saying it. I mean, some things I do are completely crazy. I think would seem like it to other people. I believe that in the framework of this music theory, the exaltations and depressions will turn out uh, to represent sharps and flats that give you the different, uh, the, the various different musical scales that the, that the Greeks had. So that there is, in fact, I believe, a well-worked-out um, music of the spheres paradigm um, that, is, that is lying there uh, in wait the behind the... Uh, yeah, and um, I haven't finished this work, it's, it, it, and so... Uh, Anyway, so there is definitely a music connection going on here. Not only that, the the, the planets are are associated with vowels, the seven vowels, and this is an old tradition. And the the way in which the Greeks understood vowels is that, as as opposed to consonants, is that the vowels uh, weren't just sounded. It's not just that your vocal cords would vibrate. It's that vowels were capable of pitch, pitch differences, mm-hmm. consonants or not. So vowels were, would be like pitched sound, but the planets are associated with the vowels. So a planet in its exaltation uh, is like it, it's being pitched, uh, sharp, flatted. Um, Made to I stand mean, out in some way. That's right, that's and, right. And, it, and so this is the, and if it's depressed... That may mean that you could think of it as being like a diminished chord. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, yeah. Which certainly, it's interesting. It adds flavor to music. You don't you don't want to be listening to major scale major right. chords all day long. You want to you want to hear them 
uh, made interesting, made more that's w- right. w- you know wistful. That's right. Like <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah and it's so th- this th- this to me is very exciting. I mean, I haven't finished my work in it, but but the I mean, I, I tell you, Eric. I mean, the depths t- to this material are you know, they're 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 almost beyond imagining. I mean, when I first started in this stuff. You know, I was hoping that there would be something in them to justify the time I was taking to do the translations. But the oh, the, the further I got into it, I've never seen anything like this. It, the, 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 this highly integrated system of concepts, all of these paradigms, like musical paradigms, language paradigms, everything worked together here in this absolutely extraordinary system. I mean, I've been reading, you know, relatively difficult or complicated books all my life, uh, you know, particularly works in philosophy, but I've never seen anything like this, yep. ever. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm still dumbfounded by it. Um, yes. So we're heir to something really quite brilliant, as we, even, in, even in its adulterated forms, there's, there, there's some of this uh, elegance that... It, it's still, I mean, modern astrologers still use signs, planets, aspects, houses. Um, they don't use them in the same way, and then they, they've they lost all sorts of timing methods. I mean, the Greeks did have what we would call directions and even secondary progressions, but uh, there there are so many timing procedures that are that just didn't make it, and all of those, by the way, also have their own systematic arrangement. So everything is systematic, everything, um, and that and that's gratifying to me because, insofar as it's systematic, you can you know you, you get you begin to get an idea of how to interpret it. Yeah. Um, like all these different time lord procedures that that we've known about since about 1994, the what people do is, is they just have a bunch of them at their disposal and they just try to, oh, well, I'm going to use this and see what, you know, and I'm going to use that. What they don't realize is that, that some of them are context-specific, you know, some of them are to be used together and others not. And so it, 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 in my opinion, at the risk of insulting many of your listeners, I mean, I think modern astrologers are technique-mad, you know, um, and, and are just... The more techniques, the better. I mean, why? Well, you know, well, I, I'm not getting a good result here. Try another technique. Oh, that one worked. I, I mean, I mean, maybe that's not fair, but but that's what that's what it seems to be. To well, me a lot of times. yeah, okay. So the, the the parallel equivalent in 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 music is, you know, all the music theory in the world does not get you a beautiful song. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You can use exactly. some theory. Yeah. Uh, to, to to help you move around, or you might there's always one person in the band who like can tell you the difference between the you know major minor seventh and a major mm-hmm. seventh and all this, but ultimately uh, something else is composing the, yeah. the music, and the theory is really just explaining what was done. Yeah. Uh, and I think with astrology, we need a balance, as in most arts, you know, bet- you I, know between between the left would, and right I, hemisphere thinking. Yeah. Right, because the Greeks are famous for having left hemisphere dominance. I mean, the the, the book you, so, you're saying that Socrates was, uh, no, Plato was suspicious of, of the book as a thing. Yeah, the written the written book. And when yeah. you look at the work of Marshall McLuhan talking about what that did to us, yeah, he, yeah. He, McLuhan uh, McLuhan's theory is that the that the that the printed alphabet, with phonetic alphabet in particular, pushed the visual sense so hard. That we created subject-object division, mm-hmm. and 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 therefore self versus other. Mm-hmm. I am me, and this is the tribe. We are different things. He's he is saying that this was pushed by the visual se- the visual sense, which was engaged by the phonetic alphabet. I mean, that's certainly an interesting hypothesis. I haven't heard Marshall McLuhan's name for how many years. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, anyway. listening to Planet Waves, we, he's he's yeah. he, every week, and uh, and I, you know, his uh, son and grandson are you know helping me. The first person I'm going to send this to is Eric McLuhan, by the way. In case oh, you're really? Okay. <laughs> because his it's right in his f- 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 field so of, of interest, especially your ideas about the Greeks, which are yeah. You know, I'm reading the Laws of Media, which is talking about. Um, well, hold on. Hmm. 
I want to just find my bookmark in, in Laws of Media, which is deeply invested in, in understanding the Greeks' uh, thinking uh, about, well, the creation of visual ground from the, from the alphabet, um, the, dominance of the, the dominance of the rational brain, what we call the left brain, and the, the suppression of the right brain by the by the left by the this intense use of concept and mathematics and and, and mm-hmm. these beautiful elegant structures you know the other side of the brain wants to get in on it and yeah i well, I've, i'm i i have been emphasizing the systematic rational logical character of this what what if you want to call it which which is certainly there but i don't want to imply that the the reading of a chart using uh, Greek methods, even even if they're fully understood, is ever, would ever be something that could be done mechanically. Yes. This and, is so and, important. I mean, and I don't think it was intended to, to be used that way. I think that, I mean, you've read charts, and many of your listeners have read charts. I mean, when I've read charts, and I see... The you know the the whole concept structure uh, that's going on here, and you know running through the chart and looking at the things that you have to look at from the you know from the point of view of of a Greek thing, it it's a kind of preparation of the of the mind mm-hmm. for the the kind of magical things that can happen in readings. Yes. You know, and and it's sort of like going through your kata or something. You know, you know what I mean? It, it's a preparatory. Uh, you know, exercise, mm-hmm. and then, then you know, it, it. I'm sure it happens to all astrologers. All of a sudden, a question comes in your mind. You know, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> that you, you don't even know why you brought the question up and asked the person that. Um, I mean, I, I was doing a chart for an old friend of mine, the woman I went to high school with, and she's crazy about horses. Okay, and has been all the time. But she also was involved in these, like, the hunts, you know, where they don't actually have a fox, but they have something that looks like a fox, and people get on the horses and chase it. Mm-hmm. And so there's a whole culture that, that does this. And so she's been involved with horses and, and that type of thing all of her life. So I was, after we, you know, after I, you know, reestablished contact with her after almost like 40 years, um, and I'm looking at her chart, and and I'm having a little problem because I might have to rectify something, and I've got to get the sign right. She's right on the border here, so I was asking her some questions, and she had a you know Mars in the ninth, in the ninth, and and I mean this isn't really even a, wouldn't even be a standard Greek question, but the, the question that came into my mind is you know, do you consider the hunt to be a religious experience? Mm-hmm. And and she just hesitated, and she told me then the story about the first time she ever heard the hounds baying. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was it just went right to the heart of things. I have no idea where that question came from, mm-hmm. um, and, and you know. But I don't think I would have it would have arisen for me if I hadn't done that prep work, and I weren't using. <laughs> the left part of my brain or something, yeah. if for no other reason than just to get very secure preparation. You know, for, for, so I do, but see, even for the Greeks, I mean, we tend to think of them as you know, maybe overly logical or, or something, but I don't see them that way. Mm-hmm. See, And um, there's an awful lot of poetry, even in their otherwise dry philosophical writing, and, and, you know, and, and visionary things that um, like, like it's very clear that that Plato. This might not be true of Aristotle, but Plato thinks that there are limitations to where we can, what we can achieve or understand using logos or reason alone. Mm-hmm. I mean that there there are boundaries. I mean we can't get by them, and and that's a through through a rational process. Simply, um, you know, there can be other routes. There can be, you know, divine madness. You know, you, there are certain things that you might be inspired with that you would not have ordinary rational access to. Yeah, and they had a God Plato for everything. Could, they had a God for but, everything. Oh, sure. Yes, yes. And uh, and then we there's the famous uh, 
<laughs> from Plato's Symposium, right? Uh, you know, which is basically a drinking party uh, <laughs> with Aristophanes, the comic playwright, and Plato, or, or rather, and Socrates, who are the only ones left, left standing, by the way, <laughs> after the end of the drinking party. And, you know, and the statement's made, well, you got to consider everything twice, once drunk and once sober. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on in that Greek world than... Uh, and not only that, I mean, this quote that I, we started with, with Eudoxus, that, um, you know, he's saying the magic arts are, are, the, the, are superior. I mean, that's not... I mean, Eudoxus must have had a really powerful rational intellect but he's making that statement. I mean, it, things are not really what they seem. You know, I, I would say. Um, anyway, yeah. This, of course, is all you know. My hypothesis that Eudoxus is our man, and uh, I'm sure there it's going to be met with storms of protest. And, um. <laughs> you just hang out with him for a while. I mean, you know, <laughs> anybody who's who's going to get on the picket line. Just, just hang out with Eudoxus for a while. I mean, first of all, we could do better than a hedonist mathematician. Worse, rather yes. than a hedonist mathematician. Like, because I wrote to my friend, well, he was in, he was into math and fucking. I mean, no, no, no. He was. He, tell me he what a hedonist that, was. Tell me what a hedonist no, was. In no, their no. He, hedon may means pleasure, yeah, and yeah. it is true. It is true that um, that Eudoxus had a metaphysical view that pleasure was the highest good. Yes. That is a view of his. Yes, yes, yes. And that's why some people would call him a hedonist. But we have it on good, the good authority of Aristotle that despite the fact that he held that view, Aristotle says he held it because he thought it was the truth of things, Eudoxus himself was a very temperate man. Y yes, just, and, just for the and, record. and there are temperate, yes, yeah, I get it, but there are temperate hedonists who take pleasure in being temperate and in going to work every day and, <laughs> Certainly, yeah. you know, uh, and, and believe in moderation uh, as yeah, a path sure. to hedonism. Yeah, you can't have that much not fun a... if you're drunk all the time because you're going no, to lose that's your house. Absolutely true. <laughs> you, can't, you don't have a bed to sleep in for a while yeah. or you peed in it too many times. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bob, this has been fucking glorious, so thank you. <laughs> Speaking it's of fucking, fun. It's always, <laughs> it's always fun talking to you, Eric. And all right. So, cool. I'm glad you feel that uh, We'll we'll do it again at some point. Well, no I doubt. think the houses discussion is um, is is a beautiful one because um, it's a it's a topic dear to my heart, and I think that it's being overly simplified by the um, fundamentalist Republican uh, classical astrologers. I I am certain of that, and uh, I pre I presented an argument. <laughs> I mean, I, I at least hope somebody will address my argument. Maybe it's wrong. I don't think so. Uh, but it, it, the thing that I don't understand is, is I actually gave a justification for the use of whole sign houses. I mean, I gave a justification for it. It's just that the, the interpretation of them is subtler than, than has been recognized. Yes. Um, you know, just briefly, you know, you've got a whole sign place, but you have to take into account the cusp of the equal place there, because it's dividing the whole sign place into two completely different sectors, yes. which have a completely different character. Yes. And and I try. I mean, the. I mean, I'm partly responsible for the you know the whole sign house movement. I mean, simply because we we found all kinds of texts that were you know talking about whole sign places, yeah. but. But you cannot conclude from the prevalence of whole sign places in uh, different texts that they were either the original uh, system or the the dominant system. In fact, that's not really even true. There, I mean, there are all kinds of references to to an you know to a system of equal places. I mean, Firbicus Maternus, Valens. Uh, uh, this anonymous papyrus thing, uh, uh, in another text that I've never published, Ptolemy, I mean, it's all over the place. It has to be accounted for. Yeah. But everyone is thinking so much, oh, they're, they're variant systems, you know, like because we've got variant house systems today. Yeah. But that would I mean a Greek isn't going to do that. Oh, we're going to have two completely different systems? I mean, that, that, would, be, that would be like a terrible flaw. Right. So you're saying we're that talking they about Greeks here. They, they overlay. See, the, I've had the best results either. Bob? Yeah, I'm yeah. here. I've yeah. had the best results using whole signs when I cast 
I, I don't cast the charts specially with whole sign houses. Yeah. I just look at them beneath the layer of the yeah. houses that I'm using, and they, they, I can kind of flash back and forth between the whole sign place and the I use Coke houses, the Coke yeah. place, and get a kind of a moving image, a kind of a composite of of the two. And sometimes the whole sign place will something will come booming out, and sometimes the Coke, you know the equivalent of whatever a normal house system yeah and when they're overlaid over each other that it's it's much more elegant and and you're not locked into one interpretation the charts offering you options for how to yeah. look at something for yeah. one thing and the the coke house overlaid over the whole sign place is as i learned from you many years ago is a peak of the energy within the whole sign place Cusp yeah. means peak. It, it doesn't mean edge. It means the peak. Uh, it, 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 uh, it originally means a sharp point. Yeah. Okay, but, but that means yeah, like something that will goad something, simulate it, yes. right? I yeah. mean, yeah. and, Coke, and yeah. so, yeah, so um, those, those cusps are, are, the idea of a cusp is interesting. One of the, one of the big errors I see out there is that people who, who use whole sign places exclusively tend to think of the sign borders as cusps. Yep. They're not cusps. No. They're just sign borders. Yep. You know? no, the, and, the, um, the degree of the ascendant in each of those is your cusp. Yeah, exactly. And and this is this is quite simple and um, it, it once I started working it out in in, in more detail, um, I I cert I haven't I'm intending to <clears throat> expand that that PDF file that was in there. It's about 60 pages or something. I'm intending to exp expand that into a full monograph. Um, and, and I have a lot more material to put in there. But I don't, I, I don't understand why there would be resistance to this. I, I mean, well, I never understand that. But um, anyway. are a resistant lot. I mean, they really. Uh, you know, just already, it's oh well. There's you know, there's no justification for this, or you know. And I'm just saying, well, this is what the texts say. Yeah, it, it, it's not easy to get the to get the the concept out because it's in. You know, you have to winkle it out of some of these cryptic texts. Yeah. But you know, but I think I did that. Anyway, I, I really like the I like the feel of it. Um, I like the feel of it a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, whether it works or not is a different issue, <laughs> but that's and, always the issue, isn't it? Yeah, and that's an, and that's an experiment. You got to pick up the guitar and play it at a certain point. Really, I mean, <laughs> right. yeah. you could talk about it all day, but you're not going to yeah. rock out. Right. Okay, Bob. Thank you again, truly, from the bottom thank, of my heart. Thank you, and we'll uh, we'll talk again sometime. All right. Here. And this uh, should be coming out on uh, Tuesday, the twenty. Sixth this tomorrow, right? And uh, I'm, I, I, I'm the last person in the world to ask for a date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a date. All right. Thank you again. Okay. Hello. Okay. Bye now. Bye for now. Mm hmm.